Dating the Iroquois Confederacy by Bruce E. Johansson. The Haudenosaunee, Iroquois, Confederacy, one of the world's oldest democracies, is at least three centuries older than most previous estimates, according to research by Barbara Mann and Jerry Fields of Toledo University, Ohio. Using a combination of documentary sources, solar eclipse data, and Iroquois oral history, Mann and Fields assert that the Iroquois Confederacy's body of law was adopted by the Senecas, the last of the five nations to ratify it, August 31, 1142. The Ratification Council convened at a site that is now a football field in Victor, New York. The site is called Ganondaga by the Seneca. Mann, a doctoral student in American Studies at Toledo University of Ohio, Fields, an astronomer, is an expert in the history of solar eclipses. The Seneca's oral history mentions that the Seneca's adopted the Iroquois Great Law of Peace shortly after a total eclipse of the sun. Mann and Fields are the first scholars to combine documentary history with oral accounts and precise solar data in an attempt to date the origin of the Iroquois League. Depending on how democracy is defined, their date of 1142 AD would rank the Iroquois Confederacy with the government of Iceland and the Swiss cantons as the oldest continuously functioning democracy on Earth. All three precedents have been cited as forerunners of the United States system of representative democracy. The Haudenosaunee Confederacy functions today in upstate New York, it even issues passports. The date that Mann and Fields assert for the founding of the Iroquois Confederacy is more than 300 years earlier than the current consensus of scholarship. Many experts date the formation of the Confederacy to the year 1451, at the time of another solar eclipse. Mann and Fields contend that the 1451 eclipse was total, but that its shadow fell over Pennsylvania, well to the southwest of the ratifying council's location. According to Mann, the Seneca were the last of the five Iroquois nations to accept the great law of peace. In an academic paper titled, A Sign in the Sky, Dating the League of the Haudenosaunee, Mann estimates that the journey of Deganawida, the peacemaker, and Hiawatha in support of the great law had begun about a quarter century earlier with the Mohawks, at the eastern door of the Confederacy, about 25 years earlier. Haudenosaunee means people of the longhouse. Iroquois is a French term for the United Nations of the Haudenosaunee, who also were called the Six Nations by English colonists. The five original nations, Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, and Seneca, were joined by the Tuscaroras about 1700 AD. The 1451 founding date was first proposed in 1948 by Paul A. W. Wallace, who gathered Iroquois oral history in his White Roots of Peace and other works. In her paper, Mann suggests that Wallace knew enough of the Seneca's oral history to realize that a solar eclipse was a key element to determining the founding date. Wallace also was fluent in German, the language in which he would need to read T. R. Apolzer's Canon der Finsternis, the best historical eclipse tables available at the time. The first pre-contact solar eclipse in Seneca country occurred June 28, 1451. Mann believes that Wallace did not dare risk an earlier date because of the academic politics of the late 1940s. As late as 1949, writes Mann, white scholars were still trying to insist that Europeans had invented wampum a backbone artifact of the League. The argument that the Iroquois League was established substantially before contact with Europeans is supported by oral history accounts. Mann and Fields cite Paula Underwood, a contemporary Iroquois oral historian, who estimated the League's founding date as AD 1090 by using family lineages as temporal benchmarks. Another traditional method to estimate the founding date is to count the number of people who have held the office of Tadadaho, Speaker of the Confederacy. A graphic record is available in the form of a cane that the 18th-century French observer Lafitau called the stick of enlistment, and modern-day anthropologist William N. Fenton calls the condolence cane. Mann and Fields used a figure of 145 Tadadahos, from Mohawk oral historian Jake Swamp, and then averaged the average tenure of other lifetime appointments, such as popes, European kings and queens, and U.S. Supreme Court justices. Cautioning that different socio-historical institutions are being compared, they figure into their sample 333 monarchs from eight European countries, 95 Supreme Court, justices, and 129 popes. Averaging the tenures of all three groups, Mann and Fields found an estimated date that compares roughly to the 1142 date indicated by the eclipse record, and the 1090 date calculated from family lineages by Underwood. Mann and Fields also make their case with archaeological evidence. 
The rise in interpersonal violence that predated the Iroquois League can be tied to a cannibal cult and the existence of villages with palisades, both of which can be dated to the mid-12th century. The spread of the League can be linked to the adoption of corn as a dietary staple among the Haudenosaunee, which also dates between 900 AD and 1100 AD, man and fields contend. Assertion of the 1142 founding date is bound faux raise a ruckus among Iroquois experts who have long asserted in print that the Confederacy did not begin until a few years before contact with Europeans in the early 1500s, or even afterwards. Note, the reason these ones have to try to date it is because the people, we murdered, displaced and often re-educated thereby ignoring the true history of the Americas in light of the invading powers. In their paper, Man and Fields dispute statements by Temple Anthropology Professor Elizabeth Tooker, whom they quote as placing the original date, in the period from AD 1400 to 1600 or shortly before. Man and Fields believe that scholars who argue the later dates dismiss the Iroquois oral history as well as solar eclipse of data. Since such scholars use only documentary sources with dates on them, and since such documents have been left to use only by non-Indians, the Native American perspective is screened out of history, they argue. It is capricious, and most probably racial, of scholars to continue dismissing the Iroquois, keepers, oral historians, as incompetent witnesses on their own behalf, Mann and Fields argue in their paper. Scholars who insist on proof of the Iroquois League's origins written in a European language engage in a circular argument, Mann argues. When such writing is the only allowable proof, Dating the Iroquois League's origins earlier than the first substantial European contact becomes impossible. One must be satisfied with the European accounts that maintain that the League was a functioning, powerful political entity when the first Europeans made contact with its members early in the 1500s. What I imply is that there is no backquote proof of the League's origins backquote written in a contemporary, i.e. mid-16th century, European language, Mann argues. In fact, what written records exist point in exactly the opposite direction. Mann also offers another example of what she believes to be the European-centered and male-centered nature of existing history. Most accounts of the Iroquois League's origins stress the roles played by Deganawida, who is called the Peacemaker, in oral discourse among traditional Iroquois, and Ionwintha, or Hiawatha, who joined him in a quest to quell the blood feud and establish peace. Mann believes that documentary history largely ignores the role of a third person, a woman, Jingo Sase, who insisted on gender balance in the Iroquois constitution. Mann's argument is outlined in another paper, The Beloved Daughters of Jingo Sase. Under Haudenosaunee law, clan mothers choose candidates, who are male, as chiefs. The women also maintain ownership of the land and homes, and exercise a veto power over any council action that may result in war. The influence of Iroquois women surprised and inspired 19th-century feminists such as Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Matilda Jocelyn Gage, according to research by modern feminist Sally Roche Wagner. While a high degree of gender equity existed in Iroquois law, sex roles often were, and remain, very carefully defined, right down to the version of history passed down by people of either sex. Men, the vast majority of anthropological informants, tended to play up the role of Deganawida and Ionwintha, which was written into history. Women who would have described the role of Jingosase were usually not consulted. Mann points out that Jingosase, originally the name of an historical individual, subsequently a title, as a leader of clan mothers. The historic figure Tadadaho, originally Deganawida's and Ionwintha's main antagonist, became the title of the League speaker. Occasionally in Iroquois history, a title also may become a personal name Handsome Lake, a reference to Lake Ontario, was the title to one of the 50 seats on the Iroquois Grand Council before it was the name of the 19th century Iroquois prophet. According to Mann, it is only after the peacemaker agrees to her terms that she throws her considerable political weight behind him. She was, in short, invaluable as an ally, invincible as a foe. To succeed, the peacemaker needed her. Jingo Sase is recalled by the Keepers as a co-founder of the League, alongside of Deganawida and Hiawatha, writes Mann. Her name has been obliterated from the white record because her story was a woman's story and 19th-century male ethnographers simply failed to ask women, whose story hers was, about the history of the League. The story of how Jingo Sase joined with Deganawida and Hiawatha is one part of an indigenous American epic that has been compared to the Greeks' Homer, the Mayans' Popul Vuh, and the Tibetan Book of the Dead. The Great Law of Peace is still being discovered by scholars, as recently as 1992, 
Syracuse University Press published the most complete available translation of the Iroquois Great Law. Once very five years, the Cayuga Jake Thomas recites the entire epic at the Confederacy's Central Council fire in Onondaga, New York, a few miles south of Syracuse. The recitation usually takes him three or four eight-hour days, during which he speaks until his voice cracks. According to the calculations of Mann and Fields, the Iroquois Central Council fire has burned at Onondaga for more than 900 years. Mann and Fields conclude, the only eclipse that meets all requisite conditions and afternoon occurrence over Ganondaga that darkened the sky is the eclipse of 1142. The duration of darkness would have been a dramatic three and a half minute interval, long enough to wait for the sun, long enough to impress everyone with Deganawida's power to call forth a sign in the sky. Bruce Johannesson is a professor of communication and Native American studies at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. His most recent books are Life and Death in Mohawk County, 1993, and Ecocide of Native America, with Donald Grin Jr., 1995. Philosopher as Savage. The care and labor of providing for artificial and fashionable wants, the sight of so many rich wallowing in superfluous plenty, whereby so many are kept poor and distressed for want, the insolence of office, and restraints of custom, all contrive to discuss them, Indians, with what we call civil society. Benjamin Franklin, Marginalia in Matthew Wheelock, Reflections, Moral and Political on Great Britain and Her Colonies, 1770. When the news that the war with France had been won reached Philadelphia, church bells and ceremonial cannon called the people into the streets for the customary celebration. The city, now the second largest in the British Empire with 20,000 people, was entering its golden age as the commercial and political center of the Atlantic seaboard. Now, history seemed to promise it a role as gem of an entire continent, or at least that small part of it settled by Europeans and their descendants. Benjamin Franklin, 57 years old and four decades a Philadelphian, was by 1763 unquestionably the city's first citizen. Because of his diplomacy with the Iroquois, which helped procure the victory his compatriots now celebrated, Franklin had gone to London to represent the colony at the royal court. His wit and wisdom, his talent for diplomacy and municipal organization, his business talents and his scientific achievements all had earned for Franklin a reputation on both sides of the Atlantic. He was at the peak of an enormously diverse and productive professional life. Not long after the last bell chime of celebration had died away, however, was there new trouble on the frontier, and new problems for Franklin, who never lost the empathy for the Indians he had acquired first by publishing treaty accounts, then by taking part in treaty councils. Following the eviction of the French, the Iroquois and their allies had lost their leverage as a balance of power. The British now had them surrounded, at least in theory. Hundreds, then thousands, of immigrants, most of them Scotch-Irish, were moving through the passes of the Appalachians, into the Ohio country, taking what seemed to them the just spoils of war. This wasn't, however, French territory. Even by the Crown's law, it still belonged to the Iroquois and their allies. As the illegal migration continued, the Covenant chain rusted badly. British officials, who always kept a hawk's eye on the expense accounts of their Indian agents, cut gift-gifting drastically, even for items, such as lead, on which many Indians had grown dependent. Rumors ran through the Indian country that the Great Father across the water was going to kill all the beaver, starve the Indians, and make slaves of them. The younger warriors of many nations became restless, ready to address the problem, even if it cost them their lives. Canasatego, Hendrick, and Weiser, three among many who had maintained the alliance, were dead. In the Grand Council at Onondaga, the sachems argued and the Confederacy quivered. In the West, Pontiac fashioned his own alliance and went to war against the squatters. When the news reached the Pennsylvania frontier that Indians were laying a track of blood through the Ohio Valley, a hunger for revenge arose among the new settlers. They organized vigilante groups and declared virtual secession from the Quaker capital. There the assembly, without an army, was doing all it could in a non-violent way, to restrain the pell-mell rush across the mountains until land could be acquired by treaty. Without loyalty to or even knowledge of the old understandings, the new settlers would neither wait for diplomacy nor be bound by decrees. On December 14, 1763, 57 vigilantes from Paxton and Donegal, two frontier towns, rode into Conestoga Manor, an Indian settlement, and killed six of twenty Indians living there. Two weeks later, more than 200 Paxton men, as they were now called, invaded Lancaster, 
where the remaining 14 Conestoga Indians had been placed in a workhouse for their own protection. Smashing in the workhouse door as the outnumbered local militia looked on, the Paxton men killed the rest of the Conestoga band, leaving the bodies in a heap within sight of the places where the Anglo-Iroquois alliance had been cemented less than two decades before. The day before that massacre, Governor William Penn had relayed to the Pennsylvania Assembly reports that the Paxton men's next target would be Philadelphia itself, where they planned to slaughter 140 Indians at Province Island. The governor, citing attacks on government, asked General Gage to delegate British troops to his colonial command. Penn also wrote hastily to William Johnson, begging him to break the news of the massacres to the Grand Council at Onondaga, by the properest method. Franklin responded to the massacres with the most enraged piece of penmanship ever to come off his press a narrative of the late massacres in Lancaster County of a number of Indians, friends of this province, by persons unknown. The essay, published in late January 1764, displayed a degree of entirely humorless anger that Franklin rarely used in his writings. But the wickedness cannot be covered, the guilt will lie on the whole land, till justice is done on the murderers. The blood of the innocent will cry to heaven for vengeance. Franklin began his essay by noting that the Conestogas, a dying remnant of the Iroquois Confederacy, had been surrounded by frontier settlements, and had dwindled to twenty people, viz. Seven men, five women and eight children, boys and girls, living in friendship with their white neighbors, who loved them for their peaceable inoffensive behavior. Listing most of the victims by name, Franklin wrote that many had adopted the names of such English persons as they particularly esteem. He provided capsule biographies to show just how inoffensive the Indians had been, Betty, a harmless old woman and her son, Peter, a likely young lad. As Franklin reconstructed the story, the Paxton men had gathered in the night, surrounding the village at Conestoga Manor, then riding into it at daybreak, firing upon, stabbing and hatcheting to death, the three men, two women, and one young boy they found. The other fourteen Indians were visiting white neighbors at the time, some to sell brooms and baskets they had made, others to socialize. After killing the six Indians, the vigilantes, scalped and otherwise horribly mangled, them, then burned the village to the ground before riding off in several directions to foil detection. Two weeks later, when the scene was repeated at the Lancaster workhouse, the Indians, according to Franklin's account, fell to their knees, protesting their love of the English. And in this posture they all received the hatchet. Men, women, little children were everyone inhumanely murdered in cold blood. While some Indians might be, rum debauched and traitor corrupted, wrote Franklin, the victims of this massacre were innocent of any crime against the English. At considerable length, Franklin went on to reflect on the qualities of savagery and civility, using the massacres to illustrate his point that no race had a monopoly on virtue. To Franklin, the Paxton men had behaved like Christian white savages. He cried out to a just God to punish those who carried the Bible in one hand and the hatchet in the other. O ye unhappy perpetrators of this horrid wickedness! On February 4th, a few days after Franklin's broadside hit the streets, the assembly heard more reports that several hundred vigilantes were assembling at Lancaster to march on Philadelphia and Province Island to slaughter the Indians in camp there. Governor Penn, recalling Franklin's talent at raising a volunteer militia, hurried to the sage's three-story brick house on Market Street at midnight. Breathlessly climbing the stairs, a retinue of aides in tow, he humbly asked Franklin's help in organizing an armed force to meet the assault from the frontier. To Franklin, the moment was delicious, for eight years before Penn had been instrumental in getting British authorities to order the abolition of Franklin's volunteer militia. During two days of frenzied activity, Franklin's house became the military headquarters of the province. An impromptu militia of Quakers was raised and armed, and Franklin traveled westward to the frontier with a delegation to face down the frontier insurgents. As Franklin later explained in a letter to Lord Kames, the Scottish philosopher, I wrote a pamphlet entitled A Narrative in Sea, which I think I sent you, to strengthen the hands of our weak government, by rendering the proceedings of the rioters unpopular and odious. This had a good effect, and afterwards when a great body of them with arms marched towards the capital in defiance of the government, with an avowed resolution to put to death 140 Indian converts under its protection, I formed an association at the governor's request. Near 1,000 of the citizens accordingly took arms, Governor Penn made my house for some time his headquarters, and did everything by my advice, 